Good afternoon. It's good to know there are brothers who can step in. Your voice gives way, so <clears throat> just looking around who I can call on. You guys ready? <laughs> so it's John chapter 7. We're in John chapter 7. If you want a title for today's sermon, it would simply be Seek the Lord While He May Be Found. Now, text is John chapter 7. Just a few verses there, verses 32 to 36. When I set out, I had two main points, each with three sub-points. And by the time I was through the second sub-point, I had one main point and three sub-points. And the next section really is a standalone. I didn't want to rush through that, where Christ stands up at the last great day of the feast. So we're going to save that for next week. So the good news is, We're going to be really short today, so we can pay good attention. John chapter 7, picking up our reading at verse 32, kind of the middle something, but if you were here last week, you know exactly where we are. John 7, verse 32, the Pharisees heard the crowd mutter these things about him, and the chief priests and the Pharisees sent officers to arrest him. Jesus then said, I will be with you a little longer than I'm going to him who sent me. You will seek me, and you will not find me. Where I am, you cannot come. The Jews said to one another, where does this man intend to go that we will not find him? Does he intend to go to the dispersion among the Greeks and teach the Greeks? What does he mean by saying, you will... Seek me, and you will not find me, and where I am, you cannot come. Let's pray for a moment. Heavenly Father, our prayer is that you would indeed, as we have just sung, give us grace to soften our hearts as we come to your word, every single word written for our instruction. Lord, make your word effective in our hearts today, particularly for those who have not found you, who have not sought after you, you too would soften their hearts that they may see the glory of the gospel in the face of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. If there was an uprising in a tiny little town somewhere in America, kind of central North America, over some contentious issue... It may get a spot on page two or three of our major newspapers across the country. If you're on the internet, you probably have to search for that article or scroll down to the bottom uh, to find this story. But if, however, the people of New York City or London uh, or Moscow rose up in protest, it would be a huge deal. Front pages throughout the world. And so it was the religious world of Jesus' day. Religious disturbances in Galilee, the countryside and the Judean country's wilderness, while noted by those we've seen, the Jews had their spies everywhere, reported events back to the Jews in Jerusalem, were mostly no big deal. This will go away. This will blow over. Let's just keep our eye on things. But in Jerusalem, the capital, the worship capital of God's people, particularly here in the temple, the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sanhedrin kept a much closer eye on things, as we've seen. And so, last week, when the people of Jerusalem were grumbling and complaining against the church, the leaders took note and they acted. This was a big deal, because today we read the crowd. So they already included the crowd, which were, from previous studies, Galilee in the Judean countryside, and the Jews hated Christ, particularly since, of course, six months before, at that Passover, the healing of that invalid on the Sabbath day. But they were also afraid of him. He was doing good. He was healing the sick, performing signs and wonders, and even Christ's work in Galilee was causing a stir in Jerusalem. And as we noted last time, Even the Jews marveled at Christ's teaching and his amazing knowledge of the law and of the prophets. This was a big problem for them. They wanted to kill him. They wanted to arrest him, but they were also afraid. 
And then when the people of Jerusalem highlighted this, they caused a big embarrassment for the priests and the Pharisees. And so, as we noted last week in our study, I'll remind you, verse 25, some of the people of Jerusalem therefore said, is not this, this not the man they seek to kill? And here he is, speaking openly, and they say nothing to him. Can it be that the authorities really know that this is the Christ? Remember that? And then they say, but we know where this man comes from. And when the Christ appears, no one will know where he's from. And so this caused a real stir. Well, we have three sub-points today, really simple. Our main point is, number one, and there is only one number one, Jesus pending arrest. Jesus pending arrest. And then our three sub-points that we observe. In the first place, the Jewish leader's hand is forced. The Jewish leader's hand is forced. Verse 32, quite simply, the Pharisees heard that the crowd muttered these things about him, more particularly the people of Jerusalem who criticized them. Is this the man they want to arrest? Why do they leave him? He must be the Christ. And the chief priest and the Pharisees then acted. They sent soldiers to arrest him. The Pharisees heard the crowd, verse 32, muttering these things about him. And the chief priests and Pharisees sent officers to arrest him. And we observed last time that for the most part, the country folk, the crowd, as was referred to earlier, people from Galilee and the Judean countryside, were not even aware of the Jews' desire to kill the Savior. But in Jerusalem, this was very different. The people of Jerusalem, as you are aware, they are aware of the politics going on in the temple. They really stir things up because they in on the religious vibe here in the capital. They've embarrassed the leaders and the Jews and the officers, and their hand now is forced to act. They can do none other, since politically they will lose face if they stand back and do nothing. Kind of reminds me of what's going on in our country right now, and the politics and impeachment and all of these things. People in politics' hand is forced, and there's embarrassment, and so we act. Politics has never changed. Chief priests and the Pharisees now order Christ's arrest. They send officers from the temple to carry it out. And let's note they have authority to do this and to bring Christ before the Sanhedrin for trial, as wrong as they might be. And as they hope to impose the death sentence for a breaking of the law of Moses on Jesus and blasphemy, a charge which we know is to be added later. Now, even though the Jews were under the rule of the Roman law and Rome, uh, though we know that Jesus' final arrest and trial leading to his crucifixion would only take place at the Passover some six months later, yet it is the Jews who act, and rightly so, as Rome keeps an eye, close eye on them as they are allowed to govern their people. And so the wheels are set in motion, although only to happen in six months' time, they send them to seek to arrest Jesus. And this is a good time to remind ourselves of two things here. And the one is, very simply, that all authorities, international, national, and civil, exist not only by the express permission of God, but God himself has set these in place, and we are obligated to obey the law of the land unless they expressly command us to do that which is contrary to God's holy law. Then we must obey God rather than men. And you know the passage, Romans 13, let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. The second thing we need to note here is that Jesus was only at the mercy of the governing authority inasmuch as it was allowed by him and the Father. Jesus was not at the mercy of the Romans or the Jews or the 
leaders in the temple. God, the Old Testament tells us, moves the rulers of the land like water. And Isaiah reminds us in chapter, four, uh, in chapter 40, that is he who sits above the circle of the earth. Its inhabitants are like grasshoppers. He stretches the heavens like a curtain, spreads them like a tent to dwell in, who brings princes to nothing and makes the rulers of the earth as emptiness. And our Savior was at no one's mercy. As we have noted in our study, nothing was to happen to our Savior lest God's time had fully come. God's beautiful, perfect, and full timing. Our Savior, too, was not forced into suffering and death, as it may appear as we read the Scriptures, even though it was the will of the Father, His own Father, to crush Him for our sake. He laid down His life. He said, no one takes it from me. I lay it down of my own accord, and I will take it up again. This was the authority of the Son of Man and of the Son of God. This brings us to our second sub-point. Our second sub-point, Jesus commands the narrative. That Jesus controls the narrative. I beg your pardon. Jesus controls the narrative. Verse 33 and 34 of our text. So they come to arrest Jesus. He's still at the feast. Jesus then said, I will be with you a little longer. Then I'm going to him who sent me. You will seek me, and you will not find me. Where I am, you cannot come. And I would have loved to be there to hear all of Christ's teaching that day in the temple. And we just given little glimpses of it right here. But these people come to arrest him, and Jesus simply says to them, I'll be with you a little longer. Then I'm going to him who sent me. You will seek me, and you will not find me. Where I am, you cannot come. And it was made very clear on a few occasions in the gospel with what great authority the Son of Man spoke and taught. You know, we told very little about Jesus' physical appearance as a man in the gospels. But Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, makes it clear that there would be nothing in his appearance to draw people to him. In other words, he wasn't this bright blue eye, dark black hair, six foot two, a person, his physical stature was nothing to be desired, but rather Isaiah writes of the servant of Jehovah. Listen, Isaiah 53, he had no form or majesty that we should look at him, no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected, man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, and as from one who men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. And yet, when the Savior spoke, he commanded, and he mesmerized. Here these people came to arrest him, and he simply says to them, I won't be here much longer, I'm going to my father, and you look for me and you won't find me, because I'm going back to the one who sent me. And Jesus speaks, and everyone is stopped in their tracks. Even the Jews acknowledged this, and they hated Christ for it. For he commanded respect by his words. People were drawn to him, even those who did not believe on him, account of his wisdom and his authority. And then, of course, because of the account of the miracles themselves. They often got a free meal. And we see the Savior in his reply made it plain to us that his mission and commission from the Father is always foremost in his mind. And he's not phased at all here. It's as though Jesus was saying, I see you, but there's a plan. There's a plan. And it is God's plan for me. What you have set out to do this day, it's not going to happen. Here's what's going to happen. I will be with you in the world for just a little longer. Because in the grand scheme of things, six months in the eternal counsels of God is just a little longer. And then I'll return to the one who sent me. Christ is, in fact, in these words, predicting what the Father sent him to do, predicting what he came to do to lay down his life as a ransom for many. He was saying, he was predicting his death, his resurrection, 
his ascension after the completion of the work, he will no longer be found on this earth. And at that time, the Jews will look in vain for him. In fact, just go forward six months. What do they do? Let's tell them we lost his body. Let's pay the soldiers to keep quiet. He was stolen by his disciples. And the fact is, he rose again and appeared to hundreds so that their embarrassment will never be forgotten. And they will no longer find him returned to his Father in heaven. There now where he stands, the right hand of the God, the Father Almighty, until he is to bring all things to a close on that greatest and that glorious and terrible day of the Lord. And it's strange, isn't it, that the Jews, 2,000 years later, still look for him. They wait for the Messiah. They will not find him. They did not recognize when he came to his own. They did not recognize him. So they wait for him in vain. In fact, I'm told, the modern Jew has given up the search. They have abandoned the types and the shadows of their forefathers kept to the sacrificial system. They are without Christ and without hope in this world. And they seek for a Christ who will not be found. For he has come. He has fulfilled all that was written by the prophets. He took the sin of his people upon himself. He bore our punishment on that tree, was crucified, dead, rose again, and returned to the Father. And Jesus answers to these officers, throws them off completely. And again, they clearly marvel at his teaching. They have no way to reply to him. They are simply filled with more questions to take back to the Jews, no longer even entertaining the thought of arresting Jesus here in the temple at the feast. So we observe in the third and final place the officer's confusion and failure. The officer's confusion and failure. Verse 35 and 36 of our text. The Jews said to one another, where does this man intend to go that we will not find him? Does he intend to go to the dispersion among the Greeks and teach the Greeks? What does he mean by saying you will seek me and you will not find me and where I am you cannot come? So now it's very clear. They did not understand a single word of it and they could only think in an earthly manner. They even entertain the idea that Christ intends to join the dispersion of the Jews under the Roman oppression. And, and interestingly, the Apostle James, of course, addresses those very people in James chapter 1 and verse 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes in the dispersion. So they are confused. And they are unsuccessful at this time to arrest Jesus. And we note this as we read ahead, in fact, we read in verse 45 and 48, when they came to the chief priests, the officers came to the chief priests and Pharisees who said to them, why did you not bring him? We sent you to arrest him. The officers answered, no one ever spoke like this man. The Pharisees answered them, have you also been deceived? Have any of the authorities or the Pharisees believed in him? And little did they know there was one. There was one. Nicodemus was among them. We all know that what the truth was. They could not arrest him because his time had not yet fully come. And it's clear that as we read on in the Gospels, his disciples did not even understand this at this time, but it would be revealed to him, to them. And this passage, too, was written for our understanding and instruction and Christ here about to be arrested he's not afraid he's not phased with this delegation but simply continue to teach regarding his suffering his death his return to the father in just a little while but as expected they could not understand because they were without spiritual discernment 
1 Corinthians 2.14 comes to mind. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. Brothers and sisters, I give to you today, nothing has changed. And even today, many may look for him, but will not find him. People look for Christ in religion. Perhaps you're one of those coming here because you're looking for Christ. So you come here in good works. They will seek him in religious ordinances. Let's take the Lord's Supper. Let's get baptized in the works of charity and humanitarian works. In pilgrimages people take, self-denying endeavors people seek. You will seek me and you will not find me. Where I am, you cannot come. What a terrible thought. Confused and lost world, unsatisfied, unfulfilled, seeking prosperity, happiness, peace. What hopelessness for the Jews and for the world that we cannot find him. So the question today is, how then may we find Christ? How may we find him? Here is the great joy of the gospel. This one thing is sure. Acts 4.12, there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given by which we must be saved. To a lost and hopeless world who did not recognize him, he will be found of you. He will be found of you. He will cause himself to be found. He will reveal himself to the true seeker. And this is the promise of the prophets hundreds of years before. Listen to Isaiah and to Jeremiah. And he's speaking of the captivity of God's people of Israel. But he speaks to us here of gospel grace. And the ultimate fulfillment of this prophecy can only be found in the suffering and the death. And the resurrection of our Savior here upon earth about to happen within the next six months here in the Gospel of John. Jeremiah 29, thus says the Lord, when the 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found of you. I will be found. You will seek me and you will not find me. And the promise comes to us, that gospel promise. If you seek me with all your heart, I will be found of you, declares the Lord. I will restore your fortunes, gather you from all the nations and all the places where I've driven you, declares the Lord. And I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. And we know there was a period between the Testaments, the old and the new, 400 years of silence, as there has been many of those in the history of God's people when, because of disobedience, refusal to believe, refusal to repent and turn to God, that God could not be found. And God would not hear, as we read even in Proverbs chapter 1, because I've called you, you refuse to listen, have stretched out my hand so no one is heeded, because you ignored all my counsel, would have none of my reproof, I will also laugh at your calamity. I will mark when terror strikes you. When terror strikes you like a storm, and your calamity comes upon you like a whirlwind. When distress and anguish come upon you, then they will call upon me, but I will not answer. They will seek me diligently, but will not find me. But God. But God, according to the promise, will hear again because the gospel light has come and he will hear and we can come to Christ by the loving drawing of the Father and by his spirit which will cause us to be found of him. And Isaiah even saw this 
in his day and rejoiced long before his time in this gospel cry, seek the Lord while he may be found, call upon him while he is near. And friends, right now, he is still near. Even 2,000 years after Christ returned to his Father, we may be found of him according to the promise. But a time will come when he will no longer be found. And the time of this earth will draw to a close as the Savior comes to take those to be with him who did seek him and find him. And for all others, it will be too late. That day which God alone knows, and it will come with great suddenness and we le- when we least expect him. So I would urge you, friends, if you're sitting here today, you have not sought Christ, now is the time. Now is the time. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he's near. And I bet I could come to each one of you and find that you don't gamble with your earthly goods. You insure them, each one of you. You take every possible precaution for every possible disaster. I bet you've added earthquake insurance to that. Fire, theft, damage. But you'll gamble with your eternal soul. The scriptures come, that gospel call from Isaiah. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Or be like the Jews who will seek him but will not find him. Trust in him. Seek him. Come to Christ. Christ is a gracious Savior. God the Father is a loving God. And the Spirit is a sweet comforter and a help. As we close today, let me summarize uh, by five points of application and recap. Five points of application of this really short passage before us. Number one, we mentioned this believers ought to be example as those who obey the governing authorities. Believers are not to be involved in civil unrest. And unless the governing authority require us to do that which the law of God prohibits or prevents us from doing what the holy moral law of God requires of us, we are to obey. You are not to obey only good government because then we wouldn't obey any government. But we are to be good, civil, obedient people. Romans 13, 1, let everyone be subject to governing authorities. We have quoted this word. And as we were encouraged recently in one of Pastor Sam's sermon, 1 Thessalonians 4, to aspire to live quietly, to mind your own affairs, to work with your hands as we instructed you, so that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. Number two, the second application from our text, God is sovereign over all the affairs in heaven and on earth. God is sovereign over all the affairs in heaven and on earth. Nothing and no one can frustrate any of God's eternal decrees. And all his plans for Christ's work, as we've seen here in the gospel, for the salvation of his people were and always will be perfectly accomplished in the fullness of time. Psalm 115, not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name, give glory for the sake of your steadfast love and your faithfulness. Why should the nations say, where is their God? Our God is in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases. Number three, application number three, every part of scripture from first to last is the word of Christ and God's breathed out word. Every part of scripture from first to last is the word of Christ and God's breathed out word. And we ought always to stand in awe of Christ's word and teaching. It is the word of Christ alone that can, by the drawing love of the Father and the powerful working of the Holy Spirit, quicken a soul unto eternal life. And so we take great awe 
that we stand in awe of God's word. For God's word is alive and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul, spirit, joints, and marrow, discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And I didn't tell you about First Timothy 3.16, all scripture. It's God breathed out. It's profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, training in righteousness. Number four, application number four. Only those who have been quickened by the Holy Spirit can discern the word of Christ and come to understand it. Only those who have been quickened by the Holy Spirit can discern the word of Christ and come to understand it. We quoted already 1 Corinthians 2.14. The natural person cannot accept the things of the Spirit of God. They are folly to him. And 1 Corinthians 1.22. Jews demand signs, Greeks wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to the Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God, and the wisdom of God. And we close with the fifth point of application, and it is this. It is the title of our sermon today. Seek the Lord while he is near. Seek the Lord while he is near. Believer and unbeliever. In every part of your life, seek the Lord while he is near. Time will come when Christ can no longer be found. Those who have not called upon his name in truth and believed on him will find him, but only on that great day before the great white throne, the judgment seat of Christ. And they will be cast into everlasting darkness. So this is the great message of the gospel. This was the gospel call of Isaiah hundreds of years before Christ came, 2,000 years later. For now, for now, you may seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Today is the day of salvation. Jeremiah 24, then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me. When you seek me with all your heart, I will be found of you, declares the Lord. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for gospel grace. How we thank you that we did not love you, but you first loved us. We did not come to you. You drew us to yourself. Oh, Lord, you set your love upon your church. You sent your son to die for her. and We thank you for this. And our prayer is for those who have not sought you, that today they will hear this gospel call to seek the Lord while he may be found. Oh, Lord, and for every believer here, may we in every part of our lives, in the way we walk, in the way we talk, in the way we work, in the way we witness, in the way that we love our wives, in the way that we instruct our children, that in all these things we will seek the Lord and we will hear the word of Christ, that living and active word, sharper than any two-edged sword. Oh, Lord, make us love your word more. Make us your people to love, to obey your word, and to seek you for every and at every station in life. We pray these things in Christ's name and for his glory. Amen.